Hey, Leadville Racers, how are you? My name is Mike Iddings, and I'm the host of the YouTube channel, Get My Buckle. This channel is all about first-timers, all about Leadville experience, the race, the journey, everything to do about the Leadville Trail 100. Our guest tonight is Leadville Royalty. This guy has finished the race 21 times. He is a huge part of Leadville. He gives back more than you could ever imagine. He is the dream chaser. And we'll we'll get into that a little bit later on in the show. But he is he's the guy that starts in the very last position of the race. Takes off after all of the blue, all of the white corrals, <laughs> the dead last starter. So I don't want to ever hear anybody complain about pushing up Keevan in the bottleneck because Ty rides right around you guys and you guys could do the same. So no more complaining about Keevans because he does it. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to let Ty talk about his uh, first experience with Leadville, his first race, um, his journey, and we're going to listen. He's got 21 finishes, so this guy's going to bring a lot to the table. So, Ty, welcome. Thank you very much for being on the show and appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Mike. I really appreciate it, for sure. Great. It's a great, uh, good opportunity. So, you know, look, if you can recall, I mean, it's been a long time, man, 23 years. <laughs> um, can you can you share with us what, what got you to the point where you said, I'm going to put my name in the hat and I am going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take on this monster and see what happens. Yeah. So I did it. I did it the second year they had it. Um, the first year, literally like a couple days before the race, uh, a friend of mine was telling me he was doing the hundred mile bike race and I didn't even know what was going on. And uh, we were working together and I was like, Oh wow, there's a bike race on Saturday. And this was like Thursday. So I went out and actually watched a little bit of it. And I was like, wow, it's kind of crazy. And then, of course, you know, like most things, it starts with, you know, a couple beers and a couple, you know, of us hanging <laughs> out going, hey, we should go try that. And you're like, what? You know, and, uh, you know, I'd always mountain biked in college, you know, when I could and had a bike and was riding a little bit, but nothing like the hundred, you know. Um, and so we just kind of signed up for it three you know two other guys in town and as you can imagine back then there weren't a lot of us mountain biking in town there's just a small handful it was that long ago you know and so we just kind of challenged each other and like let's sign up and do it and train together it'd be really cool and you know I remember the bike I had was such crap I was like wow I gotta get a different bike you know and let's try that and thankfully I was working at Bill's sport shop um, in town and he had a couple bikes and was able to help me get one at cost because I was working there and um, yeah you know we were <clears throat> using caged pedals and you know that sort of thing I didn't even have clipless pedals that just seemed crazy to be locked in you know such a kind of new thing you know for me you know from that aspect and quite honestly back then clipless pedals really were just kind of coming into mountain biking but um yeah it was really neat and I remember that first bike so well it was a diamondback hardtail aluminum and it had a manitou elastomer front fork and oh. in leadville <laughs> that was a problem because in the morning it's so cold those elastomers like would not move because it was like you know 35 degrees so you like before your suspension front fork really worked it was closer to lunch when it warmed up a little bit so that was always uh, kind of funny the interesting early years of all this was a little bit crazy for me, for sure. And, and so much of it in the early years was so new to me, you know, it's like I had to figure out food and, you know, there was not a lot of, you know, goo products or other things out there to use, you know, so we were, um, yeah, just eating a lot of bananas and figuring out different things uh, to eat and drink and all that sort of stuff. And it was, such a fun time in such an early time and I think the first year man it was like you know 10 and a half or 10 45 or something and it was such an experience and such a really cool thing is all those early years because you spent so much time out on the course by yourself because there just weren't a lot of folks you know there weren't the numbers that there are now you know and right. I think you know the second year there was you know 
200 people or 180 people. So it's totally different because it was just a mass start. There weren't corrals, obviously, because you're like, well, we all just fit under the stoplight. You know, they didn't close any streets or anything. <laughs> so, yeah, it was like you just kind of were going out for a, a race with some friends and some buddies. And, you know, it's like you never saw anybody out on the course. Everyone kind of got spread out so quickly that, you know, it wasn't until we started passing each other on the return or something. And, of course, you were like, hey, what's going on, you know? <laughs> waving to each other you know as you're going by and you were psyched to see somebody you know and you know obviously getting aid at the dam was like you know it was I was lucky to have you know Roxanne out there that was like the only person you know and she was with like five other people on the dam you know so it was it was easy to find your crew not the way it is now so well, <laughs> yeah how things have changed yeah, that, man how things have changed huh yeah so it's I, changed <clears throat> a lot yeah it really has and I remember uh yeah, those early years of, of like figuring out how to train and getting the endurance going. And, you know, it's like, I just, I didn't really know what to expect. And I remember, you know, getting, um, going up power line on the way home and just being so shelled and so destroyed and wrecked. And I remember stopping and sitting under a tree and just like trying to get shade. And this guy comes walking by and he just looks over at me and he just says, man, are you having a brain meltdown or what? And just keeps like going. And I couldn't even respond. I was so toast, you know, and so bonked, you know. So it's been such an evolution and a journey of figuring out how to do all this over all the years. So it's been been super cool, you know, for sure. So oh, no, yeah, no. Those, that's the early stuff for sure. But those were those were awesome days for sure. Well, since since we you touched on early stuff. <clears throat> I haven't heard Bill's Sports Shop in so long, but can you see? Can you can, see that yeah. photo? Oh, this totally. is year one, yeah. and the yeah. white, the white zip uh, quarter zip that I have on, I bought at Bill's because I was completely unprepared, and it was yeah. a crappy day, and they're like, "It's gonna rain," and then I bought some leggings, which are in this picture, which I still have. I have both of those items still today. Um, That's awesome. <laughs> from Bill's Sports Shop, which was. Yeah. Cause he was the only game in town. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. The only game for sure. Yeah. And it was, um, yeah. Different time then, for biking. Oh yeah, exactly. There's the, yeah, there's the small. Is, few. <laughs> yeah. This is 94. Yeah. This is the inaugural yeah. year when we took off. When you said we all fit under the stoplight, you're not kidding. No. Yeah, exactly. You can see the they fire didn't... truck back there. You know, no, the, nobody was behind the fire truck. No. You know, yeah, that's no, right on here. Like... It's right on Harrison, right? Yeah, exactly. Right on the, the street there. Yeah, so that's there's, the way there's it was. some nostalgia for you. It was that way for the first several years, you know, until it really started, you know, people started coming more and more and it just gently grew, you know, for sure. But I'm sure you would remember too, just the bikes and the equipment and triple chain rings and, you know, seven speed in the back or whatever. And, you know, it was all... <laughs> A yep, lot different yeah. in friction shifters versus all the index stuff. And, you know, it was, um, yeah, it was a really cool time and super fun thing to be a part of in the early days for sure. And to see the growth of it, you know, living here, you're like, holy cow, you know, from what it was when you did it and myself, you know, in the early years, you're like, yeah, it's, um, it's different. It's great, you know, but it's, yeah, definitely grown into quite the monster. Quite the monster. Yeah, I think our cassettes, you know, they, we referred to them as corn cobs. The rear cassettes back yeah. in the day because they were so small, right? Oh yeah, yeah, for and sure. We had the v, yeah, we either had the what the um, cantilever brakes or the V brakes for yeah. several years. I yeah, mean, it started with cantilever. It wasn't V brakes were like the third or fourth year before they finally came in, you know, or something, you know, or fourth or fifth. Yeah. But yeah, it was something. And then, of course, if it was rainy or whatever, you were just your brakes went to crap. So you're just like, oh man, you know. So, it did, or you go through the creek and you'd have to ride your brakes to try to dry them off a little bit. So, yeah, right, that was good. And you know, <laughs> and we had twenty sixers with what one point nine tires. Yeah, oh yeah, exactly. I know that's why I see all the big fat tires now and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's totally, totally something. You know, one point nine was even kind of big. You know, so yeah, it was right good. Back in the day. Yeah, totally. Man, hmm. it just and the, and the last them are fork. Oh my goodness, does that bring back memories? <laughs> oh, it was hilarious. I just remember I was like, oh my God, this thing is so training with it in the morning. You're like, like I said, it was uh, yeah, too funny that you couldn't get suspension and especially in Leadville. 
you know, until <laughs> until close to 11, you know, when they finally warmed up a little bit and you're like, okay, now it's moving, <laughs> you know, so right. it's good, good stuff. So you said 95 was your first year, right? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. 95. Yep. Do you remember, um, well, we, you know, we, we all know that we all fit under the, you know, under the light and we took off mass start was, I mean, personally for me, I wish for the, for the only fact that I wish everybody could do the mass start in Leadville because I, I think that that is an, that is a feeling that you, you can only get it if you're a part of it, you can read about it. You know, you can be told about it. You can listen to stories. But until you are in the middle of that huge mass start, feeling it, going down the, you know, the paved road and, and crossing the tracks and, and and going around Tennessee Creek Road and start to go up Kevens in this. I mean, the, the, the corrals are, are big, but the mass start was enormous. I mean, it was crazy. And do you remember in 95, you know, I mean, you're, you're a super strong rider. And you had to have been up with, you know, the gold corral kind of a pace. And you guys probably just hammered it when you got there. Didn't have anything to worry about, right? Yeah, it was, it was yeah, definitely different. I mean, I, I'll tell you, too, I'm a big fan of the mass start, too. I wish they hadn't have done away with that. I kind of get it. But I'm also like, I always thought it was super cool. And I always thought people really liked that, you know, and it definitely um was a bit crazy you know with some of the numbers that are going on now but especially back then yeah the master is definitely the way to go and you could you know even if for a quick brief moment you could actually sprint up there and lead the race for a second you know and be like i did it you know and i remember doing that one time when armstrong did it and that was still the mass race and i got up there because i was up there in the front and yeah got out in front of everybody on the st cuban road and then yeah i was that was it for the day but obviously i was like wow that was really cool <laughs> you know but that was <laughs> part of the that was part of the fun thing about the mass start is being able to do that and intermix with everybody and you know like i said it could have been pros or whoever you just you know it was kind of more of a citizen type deal and everybody just showed up and if you were there you got up front and, and you went for it so it was really cool I, I definitely enjoyed you know that that aspect of it for sure and being the dream chaser I liked it better because I didn't have to wait so long you know now with the staggered start it's a little bit different and it almost seems like no matter what we're kind of get a little jammed up or slow going on St. Kevin. So it didn't seem like that solved a lot you know so but it was yeah it's all good either way that's awesome. So I, your first year, do you, did you have any, you know, oh my God, I'm not going to make it moments? Oh yeah. And, you know, it's kind of, yeah, definitely. Especially not knowing those early years, what I was quite getting myself into, you know, I knew and we would go train and I would do these long rides or whatever, but until you actually have to complete that whole hundred miles, you're like, wow, it is really something and I tell people that all the time you know their first year if it was in 95 or or if this is your first year coming up what to expect for that first year is always you know um kind of tricky it's not I'm not saying you won't do your best every your first year but you just learn so much you know about okay I bonked at this mileage and I should have eaten a little bit earlier or had this drink a little bit earlier or something like that it's amazing what I did learn that first year, you know, of, um, you know, going out too hard or, you know, um, and not hard enough or whatever it is, you know, right. of course, being a younger man back then, I definitely was going out too hard, too fast and would burn all my matches pretty quick and then just, you know, limp home. You know? So, so now I'm a little bit, you know, I've learned a little bit over 21 years on how to manage that, uh, that energy, you know, and that enthusiasm for sure. You know, so yeah. yeah, it's been a good experience. But those early years were definitely just really had to learn. You know, you just learned a lot about you know what you could do yourself and your equipment and you know food and the whole work. So, oh, for sure. And you know, this this year will be my 29th start, and I this am is so still amazing. Learning. Yeah, yeah, that's I'm amazing. You've done them, done the moths. Like, yeah, congrats on that. That's huge. Oh, well, thank you. I wish I would have. And in the, in the, in the, well, 20, 20, this will be my 29th, be my 27th buckle in year two. This is it. This is, this is, inter, this is, 
funny. I, I I signed up too late. Year one, oh, no. I didn't I didn't finish in the time. I, I missed some of the course because I was so I was so out of fuel and seeing spots pushing up power line. And I, I went back to the fish hatchery and tried to eat. And I got back on the road and I missed the turn to go to up power line. And some guy in a pickup truck said, you racing? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, you're on a course. And it was Bert. I don't know if you remember Bert from the Harley Club. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, well, get me back on the course. Well, he took me to where four and nine connect. And he yeah. said, turn right, go that way. So I did. And I finished the race, but I missed you know, missed I missed the, Turquoise Lake and Carter Summit. And I missed all that. So this, you know, I was, that that did not sit well with me, right? That yeah. was like, oh my God, DNF, I'm, this is never going to happen to me again. And so the next year I was, I just, I didn't sign up in time. So when I did finally go to sign up, I got the, it's too late. So I'm on the phone with Mary Lee and uh, I'm pleading, come on, local boy, you know, I did the first one. I didn't finish. Let me finish. And she's, you know, she goes, no, you just, you signed up too late. And I keep pleading with her. And then I hear some rustling and I hear this voice on the phone. What the fuck part of you didn't sign up in time? Don't you understand? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, um, I wonder who that was. <laughs> well, he goes, well, nothing. Sign up on time next year. I was like, yes, sir. And that was Ken. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I get exactly. it, man. It's, you know, yeah. so I, 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 95, I, I didn't get to do it in 95. I don't even know where I was going with this. Um, but shoot, lost track, dude. That's that half armor's kicking in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah, no, I totally get it. It's, yeah, that's a, that's a disappointment for sure. But I think we we're just talking about, you know, how you learned so much. Oh, about yeah. About the course <laughs> and getting around, you know, it's like, a, it's a really big deal. You know, that first year is something, you know, and without, telling anybody don't expect it but i'm also like we'll just be prepared you know just learn a lot you know about the race and the course and where to go and you know different things so those first early years for me and the first year for me it was like yeah like i said i really didn't know what i was getting myself into and and it's kind of funny because you know we the first year we did it me and my two other buddies we were just gonna do it that one year and never do it again you know <laughs> and we we even bought, you know, kind of the biking shoes and we're like, well, we're not going to get racing shoes because we're never going to race again. You know, we'll just kind of get the hiking, biking shoe kind of thing. And I was like, oh, wow, that went, oh, you know, that went south fast, you know, because all of a sudden <laughs> you get addicted to this and you're like, oh, my God, I want to keep doing it. I want to do better. I want to go faster. And what do I need to do? And all, next thing you know, 21 years later, you're like, oh, my God. Yeah, it's not so, but it's been super cool, super cool journey. It's like <laughs> it's, it's so the much, best journey ever, isn't it? Oh yeah, it's. I tell people all the time. I was like, you know, it's the best addiction to have. You know, it's like I'm not, you know, drinking too much beer or doing other things that I shouldn't be doing. I'm spending way more money on bikes, you know, and other things, you know, which is a lot healthier for me most of the time, you know. So. <laughs> That's uh, it's been a great thing and just an amazing journey for sure. Well, I, you know, I mean, Leadville saved my life, right? Because of me tracking my heart, my fitness and that sort of thing. So I'm not going to get out, get on that tangent, but Leadville holds a special place in for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. No, it does. So, and I've seen the same thing. I've seen so many friends that I've met and people that I've met. And, you know, I think of one guy in particular and man, he was just, not in shape and not the person he wanted to be and all these sort of things. And and he signed up for Leadville and I watched him just lose all kinds of weight and get fit and along the way, just come a better person and a better businessman and a better father and all these things. You're like, Holy cow. Like it, it is, you know, transforming for a lot of people, you know, and it's just setting that goal and that carrot out there of something like Leadville is huge. Like that's what you have to have. You have to have this, yeah, that carrot, you know, helps a lot of people. And Leadville is a big one, you know, for sure. It's a big carrot. But, you know, when you sign up for it and you, you know, you watch people, they really, uh, they get into it and they go for it. And they really try to figure out all those training things and all the things that you and I have been working on for a lot of years. For a lot of years. Yeah. And, you know, that's the, that's a lot of the premise for the show here is to 
talk about some of those things. Hopefully they pick up some tips and some advice and, and are able to set the compass and be a little bit more confident when they get to the starting line. Because now with the draw, <clears throat> you may not get in for three, four, five, six years. And then you may not get in again for a while. So you need to make the best of your attempt yeah. you know, to do get in. Yeah, I would agree with that for sure. You know, and like some people might just come that one time, you know, and like you said, for other life reasons or whatever, not have the opportunity to do it again. So yeah, it's important you make the most of it and the best, best opportunity for sure. Um, so let's touch a little bit on your dream chaser. Uh, for those who get who aren't aware, there is the legacy foundation or lead bill is a charity that Ty raises money for. And people pledge, they pledge money per rider that Ty passes. And Ty starts absolutely dead last when the gun goes off. Everybody rolls over the chip, timing chip before he does, and then he takes off. And for every person that Ty passes, whatever the people have donated, you know, they multiply that number times the number of racers he passes. And Ty raises a bunch of money for the foundation. And he also sub nines which i personally can't stand him for that because i start way <laughs> in front and i still can't sub nine <laughs> but yeah, so i'll I've let been... ty tell you a little bit more about it and you know give you some details and if you guys um it'd be really good for you to once he gives you the details figure it out get online make some donations support him support leadville support the community it's 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 all good. Win 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 for everybody. So Ty, if you, you would give us some more details, that'd be great. Yeah, Ken and Mary Lee, you know, after several years of doing the the Level Trail 100, and as many of you know, they started the run and the bike race to try to help the economy and to bring people to the town of Leadville. And then once people started to come and they started to do, you know, okay with the races and stuff like that, the first thing that they did is they started the Leadville Legacy. Um, and that is their foundation that gives back um, to Leadville and to the Leadville community. So it 100% of the money that is raised by the Leadville legacy is stays in Leadville. Um, and it goes to their one of their main things or their biggest one is scholarships that everybody who graduates high school in Lake County now get it used to be $1,000, but now they get $2,000. Um, to go on to higher education. That could be anything. It could be college. It could be nursing school. It could be, you know, truck driving school, construction, whatever, whatever type of higher education you want to go to. If you're a graduate of Lake County High School, you get that scholarship. And it has been life changing for a lot of the people here. We have an underserved community and some people that, you know, would not necessarily have the means to go to college or to try to try to do something different. So the legacy gives them that chance to try to, you know, step up and do something better or, you know, move on to something really good. And, and um, it's been a great thing. And what the Dream Chaser program was started, um, this will be nine years. So eight years ago, the Dream Chaser program was started, not actually by the legacy, but Trans America Insurance Company approached um, the Trail 100 and said, hey, we want to have some crazy guys start dead last in the race and see how many people he can pass and we'll donate. I can't even remember what it was, you know, a couple bucks ahead or five bucks ahead or something. And so Josh Colley, the director at the time called me and said, Hey, do you want to start dead last in the race? And of course I almost hung up on him. Cause I was like, dude, it's <laughs> taken me all these years to get to the first corral. And now you want me to start dead last. I was like, no, what the hell are you talking about? You know, and he was like, well, hold on. And he was like, here's the deal. So he explained it to me. And I was like, OK, yeah, no, totally. I really want to do that. I think the main reason I really wanted to do it is I've always wanted to help our community and help our town. When Roxanne was hit by a car years ago, training for the level Trail 100, um, she was hit by a car road biking with a friend in our community came to our aid in a huge, huge way and helped us tremendously and backed us. And they, you know, brought us meals for over a month while Roxanne was recovering and would help us go to the doctor and take care of the dogs while she was doing physical therapy and all this. So I was 
desperate for a way to repay my community you know so getting the chance to do the dream chaser has been like just so so awesome i thought it was just going to be a couple of years but here we are and it's been eight and the last few years you know um after trans america decided they didn't want to be the title sponsor of that and i think the first year we raised seven thousand five hundred dollars which was awesome and super glad right. to do that. But then this Trans America decided they wanted to not be the sole sponsor. And now that um, they have allowed or now that the legacy does it solely on their own and, and everybody racing can join in and help. Like now the numbers are huge. We went from $7,500 the very first year in the last several years with all the input from the racers that are raising uh, racing we've been pretty much a hundred thousand dollars every year. And that is like, we've almost raised, we're just under a half a million dollars um, after eight years. And as you can imagine in a small community like Leadville, that's big money, you know, and of course they're putting it to, to great, great use. So it's been <clears throat> not just a great thing for me to do, but I also think the people, the other racers and the other people coming to Leadville to do it, it's a way that they can get more connected with the race and, you know, the way that they can leave something behind as well, you know, with the legacy, not just their goo wrapper, they can leave, you know, more behind than just that. So it's like, I've been really impressed by how everyone wants to get involved. Everyone wants to help. And it's been, you know, overwhelming support from all the racers and the family members being here, you know, so it's been, just an incredible incredible thing to get to do you know and like i said i was i was had a couple of really fast years i was super lucky i was like okay i did a couple 720 something or whatever and had some really good placings and i was actually kind of in the, a place where i was like that's as fast as i can go i can't go any faster you're like i had three years like that and i was within a couple minutes all three years of that seven and a half hours and then i was just like I think I'm done and just about the time I was like I think I'm done with the 100 that's when Josh called me and said hey you want to start dead last and I was like wow okay so it's been such a, a great you know uh, motivation for me to to keep riding and to keep going and to get the chance to help so it's been incredible incredible thing so that's awesome and you're it is the give me the exact give the viewers the exact um the exact link, the exact website, whatever exactly. It's the leadvillelegacy.org. Um, leadvillelegacy.org. Yeah, we should look that up just to double check. I'm bad with the computer stuff. <laughs> 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 but it is. And they can reach out, you know. I mean, they can reach out on Facebook and Instagram. The Leadville Legacy, you know, the Leadville Legacy is on Facebook and on Instagram and all that sort of great stuff. And they have great links there that you can help you know, you can click on and, and join. And then of course, um, at the registration and during the race and all that kind of stuff, you're able to go right up and, and pledge. And that's how that has been working the last several years. Like I said, Transamerica wrote a check, but now everybody can chip in. Some people come in and they, they say, Hey, I'm going to give you 25 cents for every person you pass or 10 cents and then i've had some people who have deeper pockets have been like i'll give you 15 dollars for every person you can pass the last several years i've passed in between 1300 and 1500 people so it's added up a lot you know and it's been really really you know uh yeah awesome chance to get to do it and it's um it's been amazing that i've been able to you know that we've been able to to raise that kind of money and, and of course, pass that many people. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> pass that many people. That's why I always tell everybody. So, I was like, if you if you really want to support the legacy and you really want to help the children of Leadville, just like slow down a little bit. You know, make my job a little <laughs> bit easier. And like, I'll be super psyched. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so I'm gonna put this on the camera. This is the Leadville trail100legacy.org this is what Thank you're you. going to see when you get there yeah so get on there trail100legacy.org i knew yep. i was going to blow that <laughs> <laughs> you could have just read your hat 
<laughs> I know, but I'm just I'm just the racer, you know. I'm just like the meat in the game. I'm not the brains <laughs> behind this whole thing. <laughs> you know, I'm just, okay. I'm just the dude. <laughs> You're just the dude. But he's a fast yeah, exactly. dude. It's a good thing. Yeah. And yeah. Another plug. I do course strategy coaching, get my buckle coaching, and all of 100% of my profits go toward the Legacy 100 Foundation. And we're going to, and I'm also donating to the Lifetime Foundation. So anytime anybody hires me to help them learn about the course, learn about the day, learn about gearing, logistics for the crew, anything like that to do with the race itself, those, the proceeds go to the same foundation Ty works for and the Lifetime Foundation. So it's a win, win, win for everybody, which I think last yeah, year, so uh, I don't, I don't over a thousand bucks last year through coaching. Which was awesome. awesome. And then breast cancer got last year I was doing breast cancer and they got um they got two thousand bucks. So it was, you know, we really it's yeah, really we good. Really I mean appreciate it. <clears throat> nope. It's funny well, you glad... mentioned some of the coaching things because I think some of the the questions I get the most, you know, are I mean, not just the coaching and the training and the riding, but like the logistics of getting around the course, you know, I get those questions a lot you know with friends coming up or a lot of people haven't done it you know so it's really good that you're offering that because knowing the course and knowing where to go and where to get food and you know what food to get where you know and don't forget to take your coat up columbine because when it starts hailing up there it's really miserable you know so <laughs> it's great that you're sharing that with everybody for sure you know because that's that's the kind of stuff a lot of the people it's like I watch a couple of my friends and you know their first few years and they show up to the starting line and they got a big coat on and leg warmers and arm warmers and yeah it's cold getting to the bottom of St. Kevin's but halfway up St. Kevin's you're sweating your butt off so you're like oh my gosh you know don't overdress you know there's Not all much. these things that people just don't quite think of and I was like you put on leg warmers and now you can't even take those off you know without getting your shoes or whatever you know I was like just little things like that, you know, that we were talking about earlier that you learn along the way, you know, and over all the years, you're like, you got to be able to peel it off because we go from 35, 38 degrees to all of a sudden, you know, 70 in Leadville is actually pretty warm when the sun's out. It's hot, you know, so it's yeah. those kind of things help people a lot. So. No, and I, and I love doing it, right? This That's my giving back. I mean, since the race saved my life, you know, this is this is all part of me giving back, you know, to just just to help Leadville in general I just I love it I just absolutely love it I'm passionate about it and it's great um yeah so we got the uh got the legacy uh button checked what about <clears throat> you know what from your experience you know you start with start with the training journey you know what what are some tips some advice that you can give the newbies First time buckle chasers, you know, if they're in South Carolina or if they're in, you know, Rhode Island, wherever, and they don't have a chance to get to Leadville uh, to train, to do the stage race, whatever, they're just going to show up the week before, the day before, you know, what kind of, what, what are some tips that you can give them to prepare, whether it's equipment, food, you know, it just doesn't matter. Just from Ty Hall, you know, what are your, some of your, you know, your sage advice? It's definitely been, um, I have a lot of my friends. I grew up in Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley and I get a lot of my friends come out, a lot of buddies come out. And so they're in similar area. They're not at elevation. They're not at huge mountain climbs, you know, that sort of thing. So definitely, you know, from just the riding aspect, I think, you know, getting in some long days is good, but I always tell everybody, it's like, you can never, you're not going to go out and do like 12 hours or 10 hours, you know, that's kind of hard, you know, especially back to back. So a lot of like uh, interval type stuff, he'll repeat, you know, things I do a lot of myself, you know, it's like every week, you know, maybe I do a long ride, you know, but the most I ever ride of the course or even a long one is like 60 miles, you know, would be like the longest I ever do. But it's just with, more intensity and quicker and faster and especially not being at elevation you know I think for a lot of folks it's trying to you know do hill repeats or you know those sort of things where they don't have necessarily the long sustained climbs it's always of course a big topic of the elevation and the altitude what can they do and I think 
there's obviously not a lot, you know, you're not going to, unless you can come here for, you know, the 21 days that it takes to completely cycle through, you know, your blood, you know, to help with the elevation, you know, most people can't. So they just come three, four days ahead. So I think just really hydrating before you come. Cause I think that's a really big one. You know, it's so dry and arid up here. Um, that just, you know, every time you go to sweat, it barely makes it down your entire face. You know, it just kind of dries up. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like that. So being hydrated a lot helps, you know, for sure. And, and, um, you know, I think with the food, you know, I talk to a lot of people about that as well. And I don't do a lot of science food. It just upsets my stomach a little bit. You know, it's like, I use, you know, like hammer perpetuum. I've just figured out over the years that that one is pretty soft on my stomach and it's not really sugary. So I don't do well with the sugary stuff. And so, I mean, I literally eat a lot of fig Newtons during the day. I eat bananas. Um, I usually make like a turkey and cheese, little tortilla, street taco roll up, you know? So I have more of the real food type stuff. But it's also something I think that's really important is like, that's what you have to train with when you're out there riding, you know? Because I have seen people show up and be like, oh, at the booth, they gave me this product. And I'm like, "Do not, man, don't do that. Like the next okay. day, you're like, it's just... <laughs> yeah, you're going to, that's not going to work. You're going to just, yeah, throw up or get sick, you know? So a lot of people. Yeah. That possibility, <laughs> that possibility exists, right? If you don't, if you don't train on what you race on, you're rolling the dice. Yeah, I really, yeah. So people ask those kind of questions and it's, it's, you know, legit. But I also know a lot of people, you know, pro riders, et cetera, that do, you know, their gel or their goo or their specific product, you know, every 45 minutes and they have it down to such a science. So I think it's just unique to each rider and racer. And I, I also know some super fast guys, you know, um, that don't do that kind of science food or different products. And it's just taking the time to figure out what works for you. And it's not just what works for you on a a long kind of soft ride but when you're really exerting yourself and you're breathing heavy it's like what can you actually get down into your stomach because you know when you're riding that hard for that long it's like seriously you're breathing so much you're like it's hard to swallow you know and i have to soften up the fig newtons with a lot of water to even get them to to swallow you know and roxanne makes these little banana breads and i eat those you know but i think that's the thing that people really should work on at home you know it was like trying to figure out what they can eat with going with a little bit higher tempo than just chatting with their buddies on a group ride you know what they can actually get down you know during a more intensive period and then um what is gonna yeah work for them and sustain you know for sure so and like i said some people can do a lot of those products you know no problem and it works really well for them and and, and some can't you know it just gets after my stomach a little bit um yeah, I think if I remember correctly, Eldon said, I think he said he ate like 29 gels last year. Oh, my God. And then he made the comment after. I, he's like, I don't, if I never see a gel again, I'm fine with that. <clears throat> so, you know, he. I think I had I think I had two. And they're like they're usually like on the way home on Carter Summit or the Lake Road because I'm like cracking so bad. I got to have something, you know, that's kind of quick with some caffeine or something, you know, and. So, yeah, like I said, it's just different for folks, you know, for sure. But that's what I'm saying is like figuring that out, you know, getting that dialed in and then not switching, you know, until, you know, the race is over. But getting that figured out is a really big deal because I've watched people, too. I've had friends that, man, their stomach gets so wrecked. They're like they couldn't finish because they're just, you know, stomach was so bad, you know, that they were done. And that's really hard to watch. You know, someone come all the way out here and fly out here and bring their bikes and do all these great things and they've trained so hard for it all year and then to have something like that go south you know it's really disappointing for sure for a lot of folks yeah it's a shame and um uh matt freeman who is a cts coach my co one of my coaches he if i'm pretty sure the statistic was out of out of the percentage of people that don't finish it's like 80 percent of them have gi issues yeah that's no, an it's... enormous number mm-hmm yeah, it's real. I've seen it. I've, you know, we've watched it on the side of the trail. You're like, oh, that's not pretty, you know, and someone's getting sick or whatever. And, you know, it's, 
Yeah. And once your stomach goes south like that, I think it's really hard to recover. You know, even if you try to or you end up getting sick or throwing up and you're like, okay, get it out of your system. I think it's just really hard to recover from that and really put any forth some really hard effort. So that's where it's super important to get that figured out beforehand. So you don't get into that, you know, zone. And it is hard because the elevation and like we talked about really exerting yourself for that long, you know, if you're not used to that, people, it makes your stomach upset, even if you were on a perfect diet, you know, if you haven't done it before, a race that long, you know, when you're out there for 10 hours or whatever it is, you know, that's a, a really long day to be exerting yourself. And that's where I think the training's really important to know, you know, on those longer rides, you're like, Hey, I, I ate this and didn't have any you know, trouble, you know, and, and not getting burritos from 7-Eleven or something, you know, along the way. It's like, <laughs> there's no 7-Elevens up here, so you can't do that. You got to figure out what's going to, what's going to work. Yeah, take it with know? you. So this yeah. is, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to summarize a little bit for you first time buckle chasers. So when you're training, when you're doing your long rides, you also are training your gut. So you have to find out what works for you. You have to stick with it. And if you need to, you have to bring it with you from home to the race so that you have what you know works for you because it's not, I don't think it's worth it to do any experimentation when you're here. Don't try the samples that they give you. Oh, I ate it at the expo and it was fine. That is completely different than I was going up Columbine and my heart rate was redlining and I had 40% less oxygen than I'm used to and I'm pedaling and it's sleeting and I'm freezing. And now I'm going to take that gel or that bar that I had at the expo. Cause it worked then probably not going to work at that moment in the race. So go with what, you know, don't try anything on race day or the day before stick with, you know, stick with what works for you, but you have to train your gut all season while you're training for Leadville, because you need to make sure that it's going to work for you. Uh, come race day definitely oh. i totally agree with that a huge one like i said we've both seen it i've seen it out there and afterwards yeah. and everything you're like wow yeah so yeah stick with what you know <laughs> if, if you want to blow chunks after the red carpet and you get your buckle fine <laughs> yeah yeah exactly. not during the race so let, let's avoid during the race so you can keep on going um, yeah all right so yeah some nutrition so what do you think um you know, here's some bullet point questions for you. Dropper or no dropper? I don't run a dropper. Um, there's nothing in my opinion, and I know this is an opinion, but there's nothing on the course that's technical enough that you're, you know, for me, the dropper post is like, oh my God, we're going off some really, you know, pitched rocks or, you know, it's a three foot drop. Like there's no drops out there like that. Um I'm also old school. So I've just, my technique is I can get behind my seat. No problem. You know? Um, so I definitely don't use a dropper. Um, I got my Canyon obviously sitting behind me. And when I got the bike, which is a fantastic bike, it was amazing, but taking the dropper post off of that bike and switching the stem and some carbon bars, I took almost two pounds off that bike. And that's wow. huge in a race like Leadville. It was just under, it was like 1.89 pounds. Of course, I obviously weighed everything, but now the bike is like quicker, faster. It's a great hundred bike and all that sort of stuff. So not having that, and it had a good dropper on it. You know, it wasn't, you know, super heavy one or whatever, but being able to take that weight off is noticeable, you know, that kind of weight. So I don't use a dropper, um, you know, for me. You know, it definitely works out. Like I said, it's just, there's not enough technical. I have another bike, you know, if we're going to ride that kind of stuff, you know, where I want the dropper. Yeah, I have a different, different bike for that. That has a dropper, <laughs> you right. know. No, and I'm, <clears throat> I'm 100% with you. I don't, I do not use a dropper. I never have. I don't think it, I don't think it, the course requires it. I mean, if some people are just, that's what they run all year and they're used to it, fine, run it. But it's, it's not a requirement in my opinion. Um, okay, no, so I think how my... about... Go ahead. Well, my next question was going to be full suspension or hardtail? So for me, uh, full suspension, two things. I think going down like power line and coming down Columbine through some of the more gnarly stuff. Um, and I say full suspension with the caveat of having a good lockout system. 
the lockout systems that are available now on the bikes are so much better and so real and work so well versus when they first had the you know lockouts you're like it kind of locked out but still moved a little bit but now it's like full legit and like on that on my kin you know i have the single lockout that locks out the front end and the rear so climbing up columbine is like you know almost like riding a hard tail you know there is obviously a weight penalty with the shock and stuff but I don't think that it's that big, but being able to lock and unlock that is huge. I think if my old back could really handle, you know, um, the hardtail, I might go with that because it's probably ultimately quicker. But just being able to be on the bike that long and be comfortable, because I do remember racing the hardtail and I do have kind of lower back issues and it hurts. And I remember being so uncomfortable i just didn't even want to pedal so much so the, for me the full suspension was gave me some more of the comfort to where i wasn't so sore that i could ride faster longer so that's been helpful for me with a full suspension and again you know it's not a big travel bike you know it's cross country and it has a really good lockout system nice <clears throat> okay um i mean 95 you were running 26ers with probably 1.9 tires what's yeah. your the tire recommendation and your tire pressure for your weight so i always hate answering this question because i get <laughs> people argue with me a lot and i totally get it like but i'm it's again kind of old school but i'm also like so i run narrow tires so if i can find a 2.0 or 2.2 i do i do run the maxis icon you know 2.2s which are kind of the smaller ones you can get now and then I run high pressures. I mean, I'm running 40 plus 50 in the back. And then I'm like 30, 35 in the front, depending on that. And I, I know, like I've had, I've had Dave Weens argue with me about that. I've had Yuki Aikida, other guys that I know, you know, they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I just can't stand the thought of that tire smushing out on the fast gravel and the fast pavement, you know, and it's, for me, it's noticeable. I think the higher pressure for me works well, but I'm, it, it's slick. You know, it's definitely skatey and it's pretty sketchy and it caused me to crash, you know, on power line two years ago and front end, front end came out of me, you know, out from under me on the, on the, you know, kind of loose marbles and gravel. And man, I emptied my pocket out all over the trail, was picking up food and my phone and everything. And so there's, <laughs> There's the downside of that, you know, I, I lose the traction, but I just keep thinking about back in the day, you know, or not just back in the day, but, you know, think about gravel racing and riding, you know, I mean, it's, it's like that, you know, it's, it's a little bit quicker, you know, um, I think it's faster, but then some people argue the, you know, the, the squish offers more traction, thus you're not spinning out, but I just don't. If I finally spin out on a climb, I'm walking anyway. So you're like, okay, that's it. You know, I'm kind of done you know, which does happen, you know, um, but even with those kind of pressures, you know, I can clean power line, no problem, that kind of stuff. It's only the top of combine that's usually traffic involved, you know, or something like that to where I'm off anyway. So, yeah. Yeah, but that so has I, nothing to do with tire pressure. No, it right? doesn't. But like I said, I hate to, I just, um, yeah, I would love to everyone's probably cringing that's going to watch this and be like, they're just going to think I'm crazy for doing that. But it, you know, it just works for me. So, and I know well, I, and I, I love hearing it because <clears throat> I personally run the same tires in the same width because we used to run 1.9s. It's like, if you look at Dave Ween's bike, that's hanging in the, in the lifetimes retail store, it's got these little tiny tires, with these little tiny clover knobbies, which were barely, I mean, it's almost like a snake belly tire. And I mean, he won. So I run yeah. the same thing you run. I run a little bit lower pressure, but now I think I am going to up my pressure because I would much rather have to go a half a mile an hour slower in one section for a moment, not to fall, than to change a tire because I had, I, you know, I just sm smoked the sidewall into the, into the wheel from a rock and now I'm, you know, now I'm flatting and changing my tire. I, I, I do not want to do that ever. But I don't have to. Yeah, we've all, I've, yeah, hit the rim too many hard. And there's enough big rocks out there that you definitely do that, you know, and can hit stuff, you know, and, and just, 
I, I fully understand the traction argument, and I was hoping you would mention Dave Ween's bike because, yeah, you go into the retail store, you're like, oh, my God, those are 1.4s. You're like, holy crap, <laughs> yeah, they're so skinny, you know, and I know he wasn't running 20 pounds in those, you know, he was probably 50 and 60 pounds, you know, and that's a fast, fast rolling resistance tire. There's a reason road bikes don't have, you know, big fat knobbies, you know, <laughs> they're not right. that quick, you know, so in Flatville, and again, it's just some of your bike handling skills, you know, I would definitely, you know, like I said, it's more skatey and it's definitely, you know, there's times, you know, where I'm like, whoa, you know, losing control or <laughs> coming down Columbine on the gravel and trying to make it around the corner. And I'm definitely on the other side of the road because I can't, you know, hold the line very well, you know, so that's just, yeah, I think it's faster though, for sure. Right. Well, that's, that's, you know, on your bike, right? That's, that's, yeah. that is practicing the same thing over and over and over getting used to it and showing up on race day and being comfortable with it so if you're going to make it's not what i know now it's not what i would ever normal run in normal cross country or something like that or other races that i do but for this race and because i know the course so well um having that kind of knowledge i I can feel like i can afford to do it you know for sure so Uh, that's great all right. So another question would be um, hydration pack or bottles. So I'm bottles. It's just um, again with like my bike setup can carry two bottles. So I definitely do two bottles. But again, it's knowing exactly where my crew is going to be and knowing I have such a dialed in plan with my crew. Renee Lockie, she's a local physician and doctor, and she's like an amazing lady. And man, she, her, and I have it like so nailed and so swift and you know she she knows what I want before I even know you know it's like she's handing me stuff and I just I try not to stop you know so I just go flying through stuff and grab whatever and she's like okay he just had a perpetuum so now he's gonna want water and we alternate and then by the time I get to you know the um the uh, turquoise lake road on the way back you know she's you know handed me like half a bottle of coke because she knows I'm bonking and cracking so that's <laughs> yeah i use bottles um and i don't i just don't like the weight of the on my back and it's rare that if i did have a camelback that i would empty it between aid stations you're like okay so maybe i drank half of it or a quarter of it and then i'm carrying around that extra water that's not necessary and to be honest two bottles between most of the places is plenty you know like i definitely make it you know, I usually have like kind of one bigger one and one smaller one. The smaller one might be the perpetual mix or something and then the water. But yeah, I'd never. Yeah, bottles for sure for me. And like I said, it's just easier on my body and I can move around a little bit quicker and then I don't feel heavy, you know, so that I think helps me. Oh, for sure. And <clears throat> with your Dream Chaser finishes, what are what are you what's the, your um, finish time range? Yeah, uh, usually like 8.20, 8.30, somewhere in there. I've um, always dreamed about getting under eight hours again, um, being the dream chaser. Maybe I could somehow pull that off this year, but that would be spectacular. But I've always been like that 8, 8.20, 8.30, you know, starting last. So, but. Okay. Well, for, for the for the 12-hour bubble racers, this is what this comment's about. You guys are going to be on the course longer. The distance between age stations is greater, and you are probably going to be pushing up a lot of Columbine. So you might want to consider a hydration pack for the simple reason that if you have two two hands in the bars and you're pushing uphill and you're trying to navigate the conga line of traffic, and the riders coming down, and the rocks that they're rolling at you when they're flying past you, it's hard to grab a water bottle and drink and and continue to stay on top of your fueling. So a hydration pack might be a good alternative for that type of scenario. I agree with that. I totally agree with that. Yeah, because the the time in between the aid stations, and I, I also would say I've watched a lot of people do bottles to the dam and then they'll grab a camelback going up Columbine and then switch back out again. I think that's actually a really good program because to your point, 
it's hard to drink, you know, climbing that and you're trying to hang on to your bars and then, or walking up Columbine and you can with a camelback and then even descending is almost impossible to drink. You know, it's really hard because it's so rough and so fast, you know. So, yeah, I totally agree with you on, on that one. But I think for some that might be looking for a little bit advantage, you know, maybe just getting in at, at the dam and doing that is a way, you know, that I've seen a lot of people do and seems to work. Yeah, and that's exactly what I do. I do bottles to the dam, camel back up, because you're right, coming down, you know, you may think, oh, it's a descent and I can I can I can recover and I can relax and I can eat and drink. Well, I don't know. I don't think so because the top part of Columbine is so rough and so you are so laser focused not to hit the wrong rock, the wrong line, the people coming up. So there's no drinking or eating then. And then when you get down and you make the turn at the A-frame and you start on the bigger two track, you are hauling butt. And yeah. I personally do not want to take a hand off the handlebar at that speed and try and eat or drink. So a hydration pack for me is how I stay on top of my fueling till I get to the Twin Lake uh, aid station. And then, you know, then things kind of change and you're going to have a lot more opportunity on those little climbs and those conduit roads back to pipeline where you can you can make sure that you still stay on it, but maybe in a different way with a solid fuel or a bottle much easier. No, I totally agree with that. Cause to your point, and that's when, if someone does try to drink or eat on the way down, it's like, you're just gonna, like, you're gonna crash. Like that's so dangerous. Yeah. You really have to be prepared to not do that and have that in your plan. Like I'm not going to be able to eat or drink on the way down Columbine. That's not a descent that you're like cruising, sitting up, having your lunch. You know, it's definitely, it's not that you know, for no, it's sure. still game on. Yeah, yeah. And it's so fast. Like you said, you're full attention. And with the two way traffic, you never know. I've, I have brushed so many shoulders. People are like swerving or weaving and you're like, Oh my gosh, you know, and it's, it's crazy, you know? So yeah, you have to be heads up for sure. And it's not a time to be reaching for a bottle. Right. And, you know, you were talking, since we're talking about fueling, these are some these are some reference numbers when and we were talking about when you're if you're not able to get to Colorado on train you're training in your home state you you need to be shooting for 250 to 350 calories in a bottle you need to be shooting for you know 90ish carbs in a bottle and it's about a bottle an hour and when you're out on your when you're training at home I would recommend that you write down the number of calories, the number of carbs, the number of bottles, the number of ounces, and tally all that up. And if you're throwing a gel in there, how many calories were in that gel? How many carbs were in that gel? And make sure that you can track what you consumed in that ride. And if it was a five-hour ride, divide it by the hours and divide the calories, divide the carbs, so that you know what your stomach is going to be able to um, take on and comfortably, you know, and you're, you're good with. Um, and if you stop at 7-Eleven, get whatever you get, try and take a mental note of the calories and the carbs and that sort of thing so that you can you can know what's going to work for you. And Because if you aren't sure and you get to Leadville and you don't hit it right, you're gonna, your, your day is going to be different than you want it to be. There's no doubt about that. Because feeling yeah, is... Think I think to your point too, like everybody's different, you know, and needs to figure that out. Like what you just said, like it is a really good approach to document that and have some sort of idea of like what you need. Cause what my wife Roxanne can eat and get away with is unbelievable compared to me, you know, or other people like she barely eats. And I'm like, how do you sustain, you know, but she's teeny, you know, and she can, do that so everyone's a little different and getting that figured out is a is a big deal and like you talked about with not just the nutrition but the stomach as well it's one of the reasons people really crack and go down and, and can't uh you know finish because their stomach or they're so bonked and malnourished you know that they just can't keep going so yeah um all right another question on on gear stuff you long figured gloves or cut off gloves i'm long finger but um, I definitely take them off like on the climbs, you know, the long climb up combine, I'll take them off. But just I don't like the the breaking like with sweat and water bottle stuff and 
gels on my fingers and you're like slipping off the brakes and all that stuff. So I definitely do uh, long finger gloves, thin with no padding, you know, but I, I yeah, long finger gloves. Yeah. Uh, and what about your, what's your grip of choice? I use, <clears throat> I've always used the Ori grips. The rubber Ori grips, they're a fatter, uh -huh. bigger. But here, the last couple of years, I've used that foam grip, like the extra thick foam grip. Yep. I found on the longer rides that that thicker um, grip is a lot more comfortable on my hand than the really thin, you know, racy grips. Um, they don't slide or spin where I was having trouble with some of the other grips. If it was raining or we went through water or something, that that grip would spin. And I would that really causes trouble if your grip is moving. Um, I've never used a lock in a lock on again, the weight and all that kind of stuff. And those foam grips are super light as well. And those have stayed on really well and provided that comfort, you know, the squish that I, that I've wanted, you know, so those have been good. Yeah. And I, I, I use those foam grips as well. Love them. Yeah. Um, and just since we touched on grip, if there's any, this is an old motocross trick. When you put the grip on, if you spray the inside of the grip with uh, like Aquanet hair hairspray, it will slide on super easy, and then it glues to it. It adheres to that bar, and that thing is not moving. So there's a good yeah. And I, should, I heard I have heard that before. I just never I never actually tried that, but I'm sure that works. It would probably stop some of the issues I was talking about with that. Because once some yeah. of those grips, if they're not locked on, you know, when they get really wet, they just want to move around, you know. But right. the foam ones haven't. I've had really good success with those foam ones. I can't remember the brand, but they've been really good. And are you, you're, well, from looking at your bike, I don't see bar ends on it now, but do you run them at the race? I don't run bar ends. No, I don't. Um, I don't know why. I mean, I used to and have and did, you know, but they sort of went out of style. So I just, you know, went with that. <laughs> so no, and I think <laughs> the position, you know, I'm able to change around a lot and the climbing, you know, I'm definitely like on the end of the bars, if you will, you know, at times, um, but no, yeah, I'm not using bar ends. Do you, are you familiar with the togs that go on the inside of the grips? Have you yeah, I have tried seen those? those. Yeah, I haven't tried those, but I've seen them and they definitely, <clears throat> would probably help with some of that hand position, you know, because I know a lot of people can get numb hands and, you know, get, you know, gets tiring, you know, after that long of a day. So I think those little thumb pieces are probably helpful, you know, without slipping mm -hmm. off the bars, you know. <clears throat> right. All right. Any, uh, any last minute, any, you know, last minute advice, any, anything else you could think of that somebody would appreciate, you know, listening in the East coast that can't get out to Leadville yeah i think just like what we were talking about before you know with with not being at these sort of elevations or the climbs you know it's like doing those intervals and the leg speed type stuff you know and really um trying to find the hills and doing what you can with that and you know there's been like i said with sometimes i go ride with my buddies that aren't here in virginia and you know, we go seek out some hills and, you know, maybe, maybe it's not as long, but we go up and down them three or four times, you know, in a day or something. And you're just trying to get that sustained, you know, climb. Cause I think that's what a lot of people, you know, like on Columbine and stuff they're like, okay, what well, that is a long, you know, 3000 feet or whatever it is. Like that's a, that's a big one. And to sit there for that long, it's like, yeah, all of a sudden your back starts cramping and you're not used to that or whatever. So I think trying to seek out some of that where you live and, you know, I remember my brother doing it. He lives down in Destin, Florida, and he the only climb he had was like the bridge, you know. And I was <laughs> like, Well, go do the bridge 20 times, you know. You're like it was pretty sad, you know, because it was that that flat. But you know, you just kind of find uh where you live and find the, that opportunity. And and uh, I think for us too, it's um finding those friends to ride and train with to keep you motivated and to keep it enjoyable. And I think that's what I get to tell people all the time. It's like doing the hundred for me is like the, the best part of the whole summer is all the rides I got to do with my friends and the hangouts and the beers we got to have afterwards of a long training day. And I do spend a lot of time by myself, but usually a couple of days a week, you know, I get to ride with some of my friends and buddies and yeah, it's like so awesome, you know, and, and that is, 
for me what it's all about. That's, those are the greatest days. I totally agree. And I, Daniel Beggendorf, he made this 3D print of the course. Have you seen these? I, I, I see that now, but I have seen, yeah, that it's I'm pretty, <laughs> you well, know, pretty daunting I, when you look at it like that. <laughs> right. And so Ty was talking a lot about Columbine. These are the pipeline roads, which are the flats that everybody is so stressed out about spinning out on, which is, don't worry about that because you are getting to, here's the Columbine climb. So if whatever climb you have, wherever you are in the country, it's probably not going to look like this. So f seek out your biggest climb, your nastiest, steepest, gnarliest climb, and do it. And do it, and do it, and do it, and do it. Because this is what you're going to come across in Colorado. And then yep. when you come home, <laughs> you're going to get to the bottom of, you're going to race back all these not so climby parts, and then you're going to hit power line. That's at 80 miles. That's very similar to that. So 80 miles in, you guys are going to be faced with another enormous, steep, nasty, rocky, rutted, rainy, electric. You're going to hear the power lines buzzing as you're climbing up. So here's a little it's, bit, just some reference for you. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, the power line on the way home is like, it's, it's so doable and manageable, but at the same breath, it's so depressing. And so you stare at that thing and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, and it, <laughs> or is it just kicks you right in the butt when you don't want it? You're like, you're mile 80. You're like, okay, you just want to, you just want to go home, you know? And <laughs> yeah, you're just like, man, now we got to climb up this thing. So it's getting prepared for that is yeah. Mentally and, you know, and, you know, at home and your big climb as well is, is huge. Yeah. So do you clear do you clear power line coming home? Uh some not all the time. Sometimes I do. You know, it depends. Again, it's like if I hit it and I haven't, you know, I'm not uh too drained or whatever, yeah, I definitely uh clean it. You know, in the faster years um that I've had, I've always cleaned it. You know, that's for me was the only way I could do that quick is not getting off the bike anywhere, you know. Right. Um, but then do, <clears throat> doing the dream chaser thing it definitely like starting dead last i burn a lot of matches in the beginning because everyone is together so i really have to do try to get by and do as much passing as i can early on because everyone's together but on the way home right. i don't pass that many folks so it's all like in the beginning so i definitely have a different strategy with that program than what other people should have or might want to have you know because i have to burn my matches kind of early and then just kind of milk it, you know, on the way back. And that includes walking power line, you know? Oh, of course. Um, so for, for an eight hour rider, what do, what are you running gear wise? Um, I have the 34, uh, up front and gosh, I should, my bike's behind me, but I can't, it's kind of the standard rear chain ring on that bike, <laughs> but I can't remember That's offhand. It's, a, it's either t a 10 by 11, or a 1051 or 1052 i'm sure uh it's the, it's the 52 now that you yeah. said that yeah it's the 52 and that so works really well for me but a lot of people you know um that aren't from here and aren't from that uh aren't used to some of the climbs like it definitely i've seen them and have encouraged them to use the 32 and it's worked really well you know like you mentioned spinning out before but you're like that really just doesn't really happen, you know, and, you know, that much. And I think for some that maybe aren't used to those long sustained climbs, having that little extra gear can help, you know, especially, you know, yeah. Again, if you're not used to that, you know, or don't maybe possess, you know, that much climbing power, it's being able to spin out a little bit more is better on the climbs, you know, cause you're not really going to need it on the descent. You're just coasting, you know, they're so steep. You're going so fast. Anyways, you're not exactly just pedaling, as fast as you can down Columbine. Most of it, you're just kind of coasting down, but still going really quick. Well, yeah, you're managing your speed with your brakes because, I mean, you're, it's, you're hauling butt without pedaling. Um, yeah, but then I say all that, and then I'm like, what did Keegan run last year? A 42 or something ridiculous that I heard of? I'm like, that's unthinkable to me, you know? I think, I think he ran a 40. I, I, just, I, we had, I just had a show with Lachlan, and Lachlan ran a 42. Yeah, but, I'm like, wow. <clears throat> 
That's I got amazing. it. You know, this is for the this is for the twelve hour racers. Yeah, I can almost guarantee you, you do not want to run a thirty four or a thirty two if you're a twelve hour bubble racer. That yeah. is not your hearing. If you're a yeah. if you're a nine to ten hour rider, different story. But I'm addressing the twelve hour riders who are on the bubble who are just trying to get their buckle and are you know are are doing whatever they can to make it twelve hours. You're going to want a lower gear to divide the load to save your matches because 12 hours on a bike is a long time. And with the extended time frame on the course, that's going to expose you to more rain, to more sleet, to potential snow, to high winds, to, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you want to, you don't want to be burning matches and be, you know, spent before you get to power line coming home and deal with rain and whatever and not be able to climb. So that's my personal recommendation. I personally run a 28 or a 30, and I have taken those gears to 930s. So it's, you know, you it 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 is a very doable thing, and you're going to be very happy. If you come from Georgia and you're running a 34 and you're a 12-hour guy, well, man, you better hope everything else aligns perfectly because that's going to be tough. No, I agree with you. And that's like I said earlier, it's like a lot of my friends that come from out of state. I'm like, yeah, you might want to gear down from where you're at, you know, for exactly what you said, especially, you know, if you're not, you know, if you're, you know, with a lot of the folks, you know, the 10 to 12 hours, you're like, yeah, you need to be able to spin out and have a little bit more, you know, not so much torque on your legs on those big climbs. Right. And, if, you know, and if you factor in, you know, you lose, a, what is it about? It's about 20%. That you're gonna lose if you come from sea level, you can expect to lose about twenty percent of your FTP at ten thousand feet, right? You know, so two percent per thousand, right? Yeah. So do that. Do that same math with your gearing to help you get, just to help you have a reference point and start, you know, start with a different gear when you get here. But be prepared. You know, come prepared. Have a couple front sprockets when you get to Leadville, so that if you if you climb Keevan and you're redlining on Keevan, you're probably overgeared. Would you, you know, yeah. that's, that's my opinion. You need to be able to climb Keevan reasonably, you know, with your heart rate reasonable, because if, if you can't, you've got tons more climbing to do that day and more in hours and hours and hours. And you just, you know, that's, you're just going to be overgeared. And I think it's going to hurt you yeah. more than it's going to help you. No, I agree with that completely. Okay, great. Well, I think we're I think we're gonna wrap it up. Ty, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have Leadville Royalty on the show. I mean, awesome, 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 man. And I, I know that the viewers are gonna, you know, they're picking your brain was priceless for them, for sure. So I yeah, I really, I really appreciate, appreciate you having me for sure. And yeah, it's always great to share uh, some of the local knowledge and and the experience for sure. So yeah, thanks again. All right. Well, have a good night. All right. You as well, sir. All right. Thanks, man. So this is the sh this is Get My Buckle YouTube channel, all about Leadville 100 and all about the first time buckle chaser. We have aligned with some companies. Bird Wheels is one of them. The rope spoke wheel with carbon hoops. They are the lightest wheels on the market. They are offering 10% off if you use Bird Buckle 24 as the code if you order wheels. Also, Carmichael Training Systems is waiving the athlete registration fee, which I think is $89. If you use Get My Buckle in the discount code uh, box, if you engage CTS uh, coaching, which if you're going to do Leadville and you don't live in Colorado and you're not sure, I would recommend hiring a fitness coach. Then I would recommend hiring me for Get My Buckle course coaching and so you get all the other tips and tricks so that you are ready come race day. And all of your investment, your eight months of investment and time and family and money, you have the best shot possible to get across that finish line in under 12 hours. So thank you guys, and we'll see you at the finish line.